Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Welcome to Paranormal Review Radio, the fastest trending radio station online. I'm Lucy Lee Preet. I'm speaking to you live from the creepy town of Chicago. And my co-host, Anthony Agati, is somewhere in the haunted city of New York. Anthony, are you out there? Hello, Lucy. Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great show tonight. As always, we encourage callers, so our phone lines are open. The number is 661 244 98 Three, one. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, the chat room is open if you don't feel like being on the air, so make sure you comment or add your opinions there. Please also visit our Facebook page, Paranormal Review Radio, for show information and paranormal talk. Lucy, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, Anthony, we have a great show for everyone tonight. We are going to review all there is to know about paranormal investigating. This show is geared for beginners, but I am sure some of you experienced investigators out there could always use a little refresher course in what to do and what not to do on investigations. I know Anthony and I are always learning new things, and we've been investigating for years. We will discuss how Anthony and I became investigators, what you need to know before going out on your first investigation, and future investigations. Some of the paranormal do's and don'ts. Also, Anthony and I had the opportunity to investigate with some of the best people in the field, like John Zaffis, Jeff Belanger, the guys from Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters, Chris Fleming, Chip Coffey, Mark and Debbie Constantino. We'll share some of the tips that we've learned while on investigations with these guys. We will also review some of the basic and advanced paranormal equipment out there in the field now. (sighs) Anthony, can we fit all of this in one show? (laughs) I I think so. If we don't get to everything, and if you guys out there want to know more, we have an email now. Our show email is paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. So if there are any questions you have about investigating, feel free to send us an email, and we'll make sure to respond back quickly. Good. I'm glad you said that. Now, I can talk as much as I want to because this is such a great topic. Okay, so when you're investigating, you should not wear perfume because the smell may interfere. All right, all right, right, Lucy, wait, 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 Lucy, slow down. Let's first talk about how paranormal investigating began. I think it will be interesting to know where the field started before we get into specifics. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just so excited about this. (laughs) I, I know, so am I. Okay, so... Where did paranormal investigating begin? Well, history books claim that it actually began at the turn of B.C. to A.D. with a Greek philosopher, Athenodorus Canaanites. His story was recorded and published by Pliny the Younger, who was a Greek writer and and lawyer in the year 100 A.D. But Athenodorus' story was already 100 years old by this time. This is how the story goes. Athenodorus purchased a home, excuse me, Athenodorus purchased a home that was cheaper than it was actually worth. Soon after, he noticed strange occurrences in the home, and one night, a spirit, wrapped in chains, appeared to the new owner and asked him to follow him outside. Kind of sounds like the movie Christmas Carol. He followed the spirit to a spot outside the home. The next morning, he dug up the spot where the spirit led him to and found skeletal remains wrapped in chains. Once the body was exhumed and given a proper burial, the haunting stopped. Wait, Anthony, I thought paranormal investigating began with the Fox Sisters of New York. 
Well, yeah, that, that's correct. Although Pliny the Younger's story was of a man, quote-unquote, investigating his haunted home and finding remains, it is just that. It's a story. No one knows if it's true or not. As you mentioned, Lucy, the Fox sisters, on the other hand, have been cited as the pioneers of paranormal investigating and actually gave birth to spiritualism, even though their story was based on false claims. Those poor girls. They started a movement that tricked people into believing them. The Fox sisters, have, as we've talked about on one of our earlier shows, Maggie, Kate, and Leah, claim that they made contact with the spirit on March 31st, 1848. Now, everywhere the girls were, they seemed to be able to conjure up spirit activity like bangs and knocks. They actually became so famous that even Barnum and Bailey wanted them to join the circus. It wasn't until later in 1888 that the girls confessed to tricking people into believing they had this ability. They had actually trained their bones and legs to make the rapping noise. In the mid-1890s, the girls became depressed, they became drunks, penniless, and died. It's so sad, but the legacy of their stories started a movement that would forever change the paranormal world and gave birth to the field of investigating that we have today. Lucy, do you know what the first paranormal group was called and where they began? No. Who? Well, funny enough, the group was called the Ghost Club, and they were based out of Cambridge University in London in the year 1851. Some of their members were Harry Price and Charles Dickens. But, Anthony... It truly didn't become popular until the mid to late 20th century. In the 1970s, in my hometown of Chicago, the first popular group, the Ghost Trackers, could be credited with the honor of becoming the first real investigating group in America. Later on, they changed their name to the Ghost Research Society in 1981. Is that when you first started to get into paranormal investigating? No, I started much later than that. <laughs> well, why don't you share with everyone how you got into investigating and why? Sure. Okay. Um, Anthony, you've heard me say it before, but I have always known there's something else out there. I have never feared the unknown. In fact, I've always run towards it. Now, of course, growing up in the hood, I never heard anyone talk about things like that. Sure. I heard the stories about brujas which is witch in Spanish, and curses and stuff like that from the Mexican side of my family, but nothing about ghosts or hauntings. My first investigative experience actually happened when I was about 13. Our apartment was on the third floor in the back. Now, the man who lived in the front apartment actually died in his apartment. We actually could hear him coming home every day at 3.30 p.m., and this was just like he did every day before he died. My brother and I would wait inside the front door, listening for the steps until they reached the landing. We would pull open the door, trying to see who was there, but we never saw anyone. I never had any fear doing this, just disappointment that I didn't see anything. Then there was the time when I was 16 when my friends and I, we, we kind of decided to break into an abandoned house to see if there were any ghosts, but we got chased out by the cops. I tore the seat of my shorts going over chain link fence that night, and that ended my early investigative career. <laughs> well, fast forward to Ghost Adventures. I had never seen the show. I found it by accident while flipping channels, and I immediately decided that I wanted to hunt ghosts. No questions, no hesitation. I knew this is what I wanted to do. I got a ticket to investigate Eastern State Penitentiary with Darkness Radio and Ghost Adventures for Christmas. I was more frightened about traveling alone to an event than of any spirit. Well, it turned out to be an amazing experience unlike anything else I'd ever had. I actually got touched and had my camera battery drained. Anthony, that's where I met you and the rest is history. Hmm. What about you, Anthony? Can you share how you got into investigating? Well, Ever since I could remember, I've always loved Halloween. It wasn't the fun of getting dressed up or going trick-or-treating or anything like that. It was looking around and walking amongst all the you know, costumes, 
and the, the ghouls, the kids that that made me feel as though I was in another world. Like for one day, everything was completely different and weird. I loved that. But it wasn't until I was in elementary school when I had to do a science project with a classmate. We were able to pick anything we wanted, and my friend and I picked UFOs. My friend and I researched for weeks on the subject, and all the while I became so involved that I forgot all about my other homework, but I didn't care. We did a great report and had to also give a speech on it. From then on, I was just so amazed and interested in hearing about UFOs and anything that was unexplained. One of the most interesting shows I started watching when I was younger was a show called Unsolved Mysteries. Anybody remember that? It had murder cases and missing children cases, but it also had paranormal cases on ghosts and UFOs and things like that. I watched it every week religiously until they took it off the air. But it wasn't until the show Ghost Hunters came when it came out when I decided that I wanted to actually start investigating haunted locations, but I just didn't know how. Um, but I was given a gift by my sister and her husband to go on an investigation with Jason and Grant from Ghost Hunters a few years ago and had the time of my life. As soon as I came back from that investigation, I started looking around for more and began more of my investigating trips with the guys from Ghost Adventures, where, like you said, Lucy, you and I met. From there, we launched a paranormal investigating group called Fifth Dimension Paranormal Investigators and started to go places on our own. But unfortunately, that group quickly lost its enthusiasm. And then I started a new group um, just recently, actually, uh, called Dimension Paranormal Investigators, which is in its beginning stages, but hopefully we're going to launch it in January 2012 with hopefully complete experienced members. Okay. Enough of our boring stories. I think half our listeners fell asleep. Um, let's get to the meat of why we're on the radio tonight, okay? Let's review when someone should begin investigating and when they should wait. Anthony, can I start? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Now, before you begin to investigate, there are a few things you should think about. Investigating is fun, but it also has a serious side. You should never take it lightly, and it should be respected. You really have to ask yourself a few questions before you start. First off, are you an open-minded person? Negative feelings may guard the spirits away. Why do you really want to become a paranormal investigator? Do you really want to learn about the paranormal? You have to really think about your reasons for wanting to do it. Are you willing to learn to inv investigative techniques and theories of the field? Are you willing to educate yourself about what you're going to do? Now, this includes learning to use your equipment. Are you able to work in a team environment? Team. That means everyone working together. Are you able to work within team rules and protocol? Can you accept the choices that the teams make? Do you get frustrated easily? If something's not working, are you going to lose it? Do you get bored easily? You can go for hours with no acti activity. Are you going to be able to handle it? Do you have a strong mental attitude? Can you focus and not let anything invade your personal space? Now, this does include your thoughts. Do you scare easily? Would you panic in a stressful or uncomfortable situation? Would you be likely to run screaming if you actually saw or heard something? Are you frightened of the dark or confined spaces? Do you think you can stand in a dark closet or a freezer or even a prison cell with the door shut? What would you do if you actually came face to face with a ghost? Just think about it. What would you do? Do you enjoy doing background and or historical research? Are you willing to learn about the place you intend to investigate? Research can be long, hard work. Are you able to accept that the majority of phenomena will have a logical or explainable explanation? You need to be willing to debunk or disprove what you find. If you can't, then you really might have something. Investigating the paranormal is not a weekend afternoon sport. It's not a social activity. A fascination with the paranormal does not always mean that you have the ability to investigate. Now, if you're a nervous person or you scare easily, you might want to stay away from the hands-on investigating. 
You have to have the right mindset and be able to control your emotions and anxiety in stressful situations. Besides this, you have to be able to control your boredom and you need to be patient. I have actually sat for at least three hours waiting in a room at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado for something to happen. But I have to say, it was well worth the wait. And when it did happen, it was good. Now, if you don't think you're ready to be a field investigator, there are many other things you can do, such as the background or the historical research. You can do interviews, or you actually can be the caseworker for your team. Okay, so now you've thought about it and you've decided Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and try some paranormal investigation. Okay, so what should you think about before choosing a location to investigate? Now, every state has the story of the baby that drowned in the creek or river below a bridge. And if you park your car on that bridge, turn off the lights and wait. Mysterious handprints will appear on your car. And in the distance, you can hear a baby weeping. Now, here in Chicago, there are stories about how this forest preserve is haunted, and if you close your eyes and if you look to the east on a full moon, you can see the ghost of this person, or you can actually hear the devil worshippers chanting. It's true, because all of the symbols they have carved in the tree, and you can see the blood stains all over the picnic benches, my uncle's friend's cousin told me. <laughs> During your research, you will need to look at the stories and places you're thinking about investigating. A lot of these stories have been made up by teenagers trying to scare each other or by people who have never seen it, but my uncle told me all about it. It's true, for real. Review the stories about the place you are thinking about investigating. Are they actually credible? Is there more than one story? Can you talk to local people about it? Is there someone who has actually experienced or seen the place that is willing to talk to you about it? Do as much research as you can. Make sure you are going to a legitimate site of a haunting and not to a place where a local legend takes place. Now, a few of the things that should make you think twice about a location are, if someone says, if you turn off your lights and wait, this usually means it's a legend. I don't think ghosts really care if your lights are on or off. Or the devil himself can be seen there. If Beelzebub wants to be seen, why would he only pick one place? Like, couldn't he show up anywhere he wanted? Again, this is probably just a legend. Or it totally, really happened. Anyone who has to tell you repeatedly that it really happened is usually making things up. Really, I swear, really. And this friend had a friend whose cousin's fiancé. Now, I'm sure you have heard this one a few times. It never turns out to be the truth by the time you hear it. And you know what? This is true for everything, not just paranormal activity. Mm-hmm. If the claim sounds like a story, it was a dark moonlit night. My team went into the building. The cowwebs brushed across our faces like wisps of lace. Okay. I write the account of my team's investigations. I do, really. And I might be slightly guilty of dramatizing what our experiences were like, but there is no need to overly dress or make up what happened. There is a difference between a fictional story and a true account of an investigation. Always make sure what you're reading is not fiction. Now, hopefully, you'll think about all these things when you're determining whether a claim is a haunt or a hoax. You need to question everything, research everything, run your sources dry. Is it worth your time and energy to go ahead and investigate? That's great advice, Lucy. I hope everyone understands that first before heading out to a haunted location. I mean, I I wish I had known that before I went on, on my first one. And... Speaking of investigating places, let's get, in, let's get into actual places you will investigate and how to pick and organize a place to investigate. First off, you should start locally. For your first ever investigation, it is a good idea to begin locally in your own hometown or state, but not too far from where you live. 
unexpected occurrences, emotional feelings, physical feelings may happen during your investigation that you may not be prepared to deal with yet. And knowing the comfort of your home is nearby may help in getting you back to quote unquote reality and help comfort you as opposed to flying out to another state and having to deal with these issues in a strange town or cold hotel room. Start close to home and maybe even start during the daytime. You have to start to understand what you're doing, how to communicate, what to look for, and also train your senses all at the same time. Doing this during the daytime eliminates the handicap of the nighttime where you have to worry about where you're stepping or not being able to see other people you're with at the location. Starting out in the daytime at a location helps to ground you in the surroundings and helps build that confidence every investigator needs. The location should be small at first. Maybe even like a cemetery would be a good place to start. Make sure the place you start investigating is open to the public and that you're allowed to be on the property. You don't want to have any issues with your local law enforcement. If need be, make sure you get permission from the location and its owners before entering the property. Make sure it is discussed and explained what your intentions are going to be on the property so the owners know exactly why you are there. Public buildings are another good bet. Do a Google search to find the haunted places in your area, then find out which of them are open to the public. For an example, an old prison that has been turned into a museum, maybe even like a docked battleship or the site of a historic event such as Gettysburg, Pennsylvania or Salem, Massachusetts. Call ahead of time to make sure that they allow visitors to bring in cameras and video and audio recorders. Most places offer guided tours, which can be very interesting and informative, but are not compatible with a ghost hunting investigation because you, you want to avoid crowds and extraneous noises at all costs, especially if you're actually trying to capture EVPs. Once you've completed this and still want to continue with paranormal investigating, you can then also contact infamous haunted locations and check with the owners to see if they provide ghost hunt excursions or overnight investigation packages. They usually come with a hefty price tag, both Lucy and I know that. But again, getting a group of like-minded friends together to investigate can, investigate can actually help lessen the cost for each person. Lucy and I have investigated at some of the most haunted locations in the country, like Mansfield Reformatory, Eastern State Penitentiary, and Rolling Hills, to name a few. And the prices have not been too bad if you go with a group. It can range between about $100 to $200 a person. Do some research before settling on a location. You actually may be surprised what you find locally and how inexpensive it may just be. One great resource I found that you may want to check out is a website called theshadowlands.net. It's a great resource for paranormal enthusiasts and also has an index of haunted locations around the country as well as international. And of course, with everything, it's only as good as the current and, and, and current as the person who is entering in the information. So you may have to do further research as website information may be outdated, but it's actually a good start. Anthony, you know, I also think that talking to other investigators is a great way to find places to investigate. Facebook, uh, you know, yeah. you might find someone mentions a place where they've gone. Start a conversation. Ask them about it. Um, daytime investigating is, is great. It's a good start. But if you're going to go to an active cemetery, just be respectful of any people who may be visiting a loved one's grave. Now, I've actually gone to Resurrection Cemetery, where Chicago's own Resurrection Mary is known to haunt. And I've actually gotten some amazing things through my spirit box, and this is during the day. But I was very careful to be discreet and not to disturb anyone. Um, Anthony, that reminds me. I think we need to talk about the importance of being emotionally and spiritually prepared. May I? Yeah, sure, of course. Okay, it's very important to remember that investigating the paranormal is a serious undertaking. It is not a game. You should be spiritually prepared. Now, you may be coming into contact with not only the spirits of the dead, but you also could con come in contact with some negative entities. Call them demons, malicious ghosts, call them whatever you want. They may be in the place that you're going to investigate. It is also very possible that something can follow you home. You need to be prepared. Now, 
a prayer of protection should be part of your investigative gear. We have a prayer to St. Michael that we carry with us. You can ask Anthony. I'm always praying. Mm -hmm. I actually said the whole rosary while in Saddamsville Church. I did. It, It just felt good doing it. You should always carry whatever makes you feel safe. I mean, we're not saying you need to carry an AK-47 or anything like that, but a rosary, a blessed medal, holy water, or even a cross. Rely on your faith and your relationship with whatever higher power you believe in to watch over you. Make sure you tell any of the spirits that you come in contact with at a location. They are not welcome to follow you home. Yes, say it out loud. It may sound like a silly thing, but it does work. You also should be emotionally prepared. Now, spirits can possess you, not just like in the movie sense, but they can actually get into your head. They can get into your thoughts. They can sense your fear. They can use it against you. They can drain your energy. They can mess with you badly if you're not in control. You should be able to focus and be aware of your feelings. Stay close to your team. If you feel badly or find that your thoughts are becoming unclear or negative, remove yourself from the situation until you feel you can proceed again. It's not always easy. Now, I've actually learned this the hard way. I went to a seance, not really taking it seriously. Well, it seems that one of the spirits that came through liked it too much in my head. I was anxious. I was angry. I was not myself the next day. My thoughts were not my own. They were hers. I got angry at my team. I got angry at my family. I was angry with Anthony, something I would never, ever do. I literally had to take control and let whoever or whatever was in my head know it had to go. It took about a day, but it did teach, it it taught me to be aware and to remain in control at all times. The experience actually taught me that I am an empath and that I have a little bit of medium ability. So now I'm very aware of my feelings when I investigate. Lucy, before we go any further, I want to let our our listeners know that we don't proclaim to be experts in the field of paranormal and in the paranormal investigating. I I think we've said this before on another show, but it's always good to remind folks that, that we don't believe there are experts in the field of paranormal, only experts in their methods. The paranormal world has so much to answer, and so little has already been discovered. Therefore, we can only share what we know and the knowledge we have gained with the experience we have encountered. Anthony, you're such a buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, that's me. I'm always thinking like a lawyer, but never getting paid like one. Let's move on to a favorite topic of mine. I know this is your favorite too, Lucy. It's the do's and don'ts <laughs> of investigating. Boy, I think we're going to get in trouble now. Lucy, promise not to name any names. Oh, okay. I'll try, maybe. (laughs) In, in, In all our times investigating, we have been around some of the most experienced investigators in the country, maybe the world. But we've also been around some of the most inexperienced who claim to be professionals or act as though they are experienced. That's why I feel we can share with you what things you should do and not do before, during, and after an investigation. Basically, we've learned from the best and the worst. I'm (laughs) going to actually read you first a list of do's and don'ts that are are published all across the Internet, and then after, Lucy and I are going to discuss a few more and, and give some details. So the first one is let them, the ghosts and the spirits, know that they're not forgotten. Let your journey in this field of study Uh, Be a labor of love. Remember to be respectful of the ghosts and spirits as they were once people too, and still are for that matter. Number two, never tease, threaten, or dare an unseen entity unless you're willing to pay the consequences. First of all, we want to be taken seriously. Secondly, we are paranormal investigators, not bullies. Lastly, we sure don't want any vindictive entities following us home or worse yet, attacking or hurting us. I sure know that one. Conduct yourself at <laughs> conduct the number three. Conduct yourself as a professional at all times. We always want to present ourselves as one in control, and that of course means uh, around other investigators, victims of a haunting, and even to the ghosts themselves. 
Self-confidence and control will radiate like a beacon of light and thus serve as a shield of protection. Number four, never seek out entities on your own. Lucy, you make sure you hear this one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a team of two works well, and three is the ideal number. Larger groups will need to be broken up into smaller groups. Number five, addicting confess. habits. What's that? Can I confess? I do have a really bad habit of wandering off on my own, and I promise to do better and not do that. <laughs> <laughs> we got to put one of those children leashes on you. Uh, number five, addicting habits can be contrary to your ghostly pursuits. Examples would be heavy addictions to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, and this one's weird, an abnormal sex drive. Uh, these things in excess make you vulnerable and susceptible to attack. The attacks stem from the entity's attraction to your addictions and also because of your weakness. Mind-altering substances are particularly enticing to them. That's why they always say whenever you go ghost hunting or paranormal investigating, you really shouldn't do any drugs or, or have any alcohol with you because it actually alters your state and the ghosts and spirits actually feed off of that. Uh, number six, pay attention to your dreams. Entities will use this relaxed state of mind and body to try and influence or torment, it, torment its targeted victim. Use whatever wording is necessary to command such an intrusion to cease. Command it in the holy name of your God or higher power. And this is basically, you know, obviously you're not sleeping while investigating, but this is usually happens to folks after they leave a, a haunted location and they go home for the night. Um, some sort of spirits will sort of linger with you and then feed off of your dreams. Number seven. Use religious relics and symbols as a protection. This is what Lucy was talking about before. But only use these if you believe in what they can do. It's, it's not the item itself that has the power. You know, it's not the metal or the cross itself. It's what it actually symbolizes according to your faith and what you feel when, when it's in your presence. And that's what actually gives it its power. Listen to your instincts and your intuition. Lucy can actually attest to this. Draw from the power within. You will find this to be your greatest resource, right, Lucy? That you usually tend yeah. to sort of stick to your instincts and intuition a lot. I I usually rely on my instincts more than anything, and I just follow them. I mean, which is probably why I wander off a lot by myself because if I feel something or my intuition tells me to go somewhere, I'm gonna go. So I need I need to kind of like just harness that in a little bit. Which actually leads me to number nine, never leave a team member behind, not ever. <laughs> Commit yourself to a task at hand until it's done. A combined effort with the whole team um, is actually an intricate working structure. Number ten, always consider all aspects of haunting. Go into an investigation with a kind heart and gracious attitude and, you know, that positive attitude, but know that most hauntings can be explained, you know, either as it, the house is settling or furnace noises, stuff like that. And as sad as it is, you must also consider the, the mental and emotional state of the victim as well. Paranoia, dis delusional aspects, and mental illness in general may be a consideration too when you're sort of interviewing at a haunted location, either the, the victim of the haunting or, or the folks who actually live in the residence. And as a final note, it should also be stated, however, that in some cases an unstable person can actually be open to these types of visitors and or attacks. Number 11, always remember you are the one in control. You have the body and thus you have the power. It's really simple. You are in your element. This is your dimension and this is your reality. Unseen entities are intruders into your space. That is unless they are invited in or find a way in through your weakness. Be strong by curving appetites and living a productive and wholesome life. Number 12, be familiar with all aspects of the supernatural. Know well the entities that you pursue, plain and simple. Understand them and the things of their world. Knowledge is power. The more you know, the more confident you become. Be careful, though. Not all knowledge is good. Acquire it with a sort of scientific standpoint. Number 13, your best protection is in the life you lead. If you are active in ghostly pursuits, then evil will cross your path. So be armed. If you are religious, then live in your religion. But whether you are or not, your best protection is to live so as to put others first. Good deeds and love for all life is your greatest protection. Number 14, don't be afraid to experiment. Not everything you try will work. If one attempt 
or one theory fails, keep trying. Simply move on to the next thing on your list, and by all means, have a list. Number 15, do your homework. Consider all aspects of an investigation before you go. A preliminary walkthrough ahead of time is advised. You should always do that, especially if you're going to do a haunting at night, you should go during the day at a location, again, just to sort of uh, get, get the lay of the land and set out to see where rooms are located, um, what obstacles or what objects are going to be in your way as you're investigating, because you're going to be in there in, the, in pitch black. Uh, number six, yeah. One thing with that also, too, you got to look at the floor, look for hazards, look during the day where there's possibly a hole, um, stairs that are missing. Just kind of get an idea of what it looks like so when you're in there in the dark, you don't hurt yourself. Right, right. Number 16, never be without outside contact contact. Make sure others are outside your team are aware of where you are when on an assignment or an investigation. And a cell phone is a must. Uh, you should have it on you, but it should be off. You should have it completely off. Not even just on vibrate, you should have that cell phone completely off. Uh, number 17, demonic possession. It's extremely rare that you will ever find or ever hear of a full-fledged demonic possession. But it is something that all paranormal investigators need to be aware of and briefed on. Full possession requires an invitation in order to gain a foothold. However, there are activities that can be construed as an invitation. That is, if you're using Ouija boards or seances, stuff like that. A person with heavy addiction, sins, depression, or someone who is desperately lonely are more apt to be targets. When any type of invitation is construed, whether implied or direct, it you know may very well be acted upon by such evil entities. Even with all that, it's still rare that evil will triumph successfully, but it is possible in some cases. Um, paranormal investigators are somewhat susceptible because of the nature, basically, of their work. Number 18, lower level entities. These are other less severe life forms that we need to be aware of as well. They are evil and here to, to weaken the population through their influence. Their ultimate goal is to sort of just distract us from our life duties and make us as unproductive as possible. These creatures are subtle but very much determined. People that allow themselves to be heavily influenced in this direction are also more prone to demonic possession. These types of entity uses distractions through such things as computers, video games, unwholesome activity. If you just get distracted constantly, these, the paranormal world sort of considers this, considers this as a lower level entity sort of taking control over you. Number 19, be scientifically minded. Strive to prove the existence of ghosts in the, in the afterlife. We as paranormal investigators cannot simply rely on the word of someone with a particular gift. We need to know for ourselves, and we need to document it in our own studies, and that's why we become paranormal investigators. Number 20, rely on your senses. Be ever mindful of your own awareness. We are all born with the gift of inspiration. We also have a bell, so to speak, that sounds off when we're in danger. It's a gift that needs to be focused on. Constantly pay attention to, to the special ability that we all have, especially when on an investigation. As you become more aware and in tune, you will able, actually be able to better sense ghosts and other types of entities. Number 21, evidence is everything. All we really have to show for our hard work is the evidence we collect. So take notes, write up reports, snap pictures, thousands of pictures, record EVPs, keep a log, just anything and everything that you can do. Number 22, be aware that theories change. So what is believed to be true today may actually not be true tomorrow. If there's anything we can depend on, it's change. We, we, what we may know about ghosts today may actually change tomorrow. We need to embrace the credible evidence and use that knowledge to our advantage. So be willing to let go, to go of old theories when need be. If we don't, you're going to be left behind. Number 23, expect results. Go into every assignment with an attitude of well-defined purpose. Go knowing you have your preliminary research accomplished beforehand and then have a plan to make it all come together. A good investigator is organized and thorough. The right attitude yields results. And number 24, it's okay to be afraid. 
That is, as long as it doesn't seriously affect the investigation or make you especially vulnerable, excessive fear will make you ineffective as a contributing team member and will make you a target for entities. Excessive fear or anger feeds and empowers certain types of entities. Enjoy the thrill of the chase and, and you know, scream if you must, but do everything in moderation. Okay, Anthony. A couple things came to mind when you were going down your list. Um, first off, do not ask to be scratched and bitten. Why? You have no idea what you're dealing with. The consequences may be more than what you want. I also thought of another thing. Try to look like a parano- like you are a paranormal investigator. If you want to be taken seriously, dress like one. No minis and high heels, ladies. If you dress appropriately, it shows that you've researched your location. Dress comfortably, wear the right shoes, and keep in mind where you're going to be investigating. Floors and old buildings can have holes, they can be uneven, and you're less likely to injure yourself with the appropriate clothing in the dark. Oh, and that does mean no perfume and no glitter makeup. Um, Finally, it's really cool when someone has every single new piece of equipment. It shows everyone how serious you are about investigating. But it's even better when you don't know how to use any of it. Okay, I'm kidding. Learn to use your equipment ahead of time so no one has to explain to you how to use it during investigation time. Sometimes your time is going to be limited when you're at a location, so don't waste it. Um. I also thought about this. Check your batteries before you start. Bring extra. Make sure you have enough. Spirits can drain your batteries. Trust me, I've learned this. That happens. But don't ask everyone on your team for batteries before you even start because you didn't check yours ahead of time or you just didn't plain bring any. Anthony, I know you have some do's and don'ts, right? I sure do, Lucy. Um, and those are some great points, and, and I agree with you 100% on them. And I actually want to expand on them a little bit. I think it's really important that you know what you're getting into before you start investigating. Lucy and I have been around people who investigate that are not as knowledge, knowledgeable as they should be and have had unsuccessful investigations. Like the wanting mm-hmm. to so desperately be, be attacked by spirits is just insane. If your only mission in paranormal investigating is to have something bad happen to you so that you can go home and tell people and be this amazing superstar just because you were scratched or hit or whatever, it's not being a true investigator. There's more to this field than being physically harmed, and that's not something you would even want to wish upon yourself. Your goal should be to go out and capture evidence, to communicate and learn about the paranormal world, to be able to experience things with other like-minded friends or companions so that everyone can grow and become that much more better in the field. I don't have any respect for people in the paranormal field that are just out to make themselves feel higher or better than anyone else or that disrespect the paranormal world. Those people, I feel, give us good professionals a bad name. When you talked about dressing the part of an investigator, Lucy, I think that's completely accurate. Not only for how other people perceive you while out on, out on investigations, but also many of these haunted locations, like you were saying before, are not the greatest of shape many times. Lucy and I have had to walk a plank in the hopes that the floor won't fall through. You really have to dress the part. You have to wear footwear and clothing that you are comfortable in and that you're able to freely walk and run in, frankly. Um, Clothes that uh, you don't mind getting dirty or torn or ripped up because it will happen. It has happened to me a few times. I remember hearing Amy Bruni from Ghost Hunters say in an investigation that I was at that she learned her lesson when she wore high heels one time to a place and found herself in a scary predicament while walking over plank wood in the dark and didn't realize that a foot away from her the floor dropped below. You really need to take the time to review your wardrobe before going out on a location. Research the place first and also check the weather. That's another point to make. If you're in a stone building with no heat or electricity or AC, make necessary precautions with your clothing because usually in the winter, it's much colder inside a stone building than a regular building. Research, research, research. I can't stress that enough. Finally, your last point, Lucy, was one of my pet peeves when it comes to what a paranormal investigator should know before starting in this field. Learn your equipment, please. What good is a $300 piece of paranormal equipment that you've spent all your money on 
if you can't or don't know how to use it. Lucy, you and I have been on several investigations, and we've noticed people who can't even turn on their recorders in the dark. That's something you really need to learn beforehand. I mean, practice the equipment not only in light or during the day, but also with the lights out in pure darkness, because most likely that's how you, you will be when you're at a location. And if you can't learn it in the dark, then at least know where your flashlight is at all times, please. Always make sure you have a flashlight handy. Never leave it anywhere. It should always be on you at all times, not just for investigating, but for your safety. <clears throat> you don't want to be walking somewhere in the dark and not know if there's broken glass or a piece of furniture in front of you that may hurt you. Sorry, Lucy. I have to stress one more thing, and that is make sure you do your research on the location and study it before starting your investigation. Know what the haunted claims are. Know the history of the location. Know whether there is electric still in the place. Not a lot of people think to ask that and end up having high EMF readings claiming it's spirit activity when it's most likely high energy coming from a breaker box or high electrical cables in the ceiling or floor. Just learn as much as you can about the place. It will only help you that much more while investigating and even when you're listening to your EVPs and reviewing your evidence. It may help some of the questionable audio and video stuff that you may have captured. So, actually, we have a caller, Lucy. Do you mind if we just stop for a minute? Oh, no, perfect. All right, great. We have a caller from area code 732. Hello, you are on the air, Paranormal Review Radio. Hi, Anthony. Hey, Lucy, this is Nicole. Hi, Nic hey, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing? How are you, How are you guys? Very good. good thing. Hi. Thanks Hi. for calling. Hi. Yeah, so we're going to have a conversation, dear. Uh huh. All right. Um, first off, this is my first time calling, so I'm a little nervous. Um, okay. But I've, yep, I've oh, we're friends. listened to yeah. all your rules, and I pretty much abide by all of them because when you first met me back at the Stanley Hotel in March of this year, um, I was still learning and still, you know, figuring out all my equipment. But mm -hmm. over time, with uh, investigating, I have um, abided by your guidelines, pretty much all of them, what you said tonight. So oh, that's great. What, so was the family your first time? Yeah, uh, first official time, yes. You, have you ever done it actually in, in your own town or locally or anything like that? Yes, before I did anything. Um, I live about five minutes from one of the most legendary one of the most legendary uh, stories in New Jersey. I live near Double Trouble Road, which is home of the Jersey Devil. Oh, right, right. Yeah, you know, I went out there during the daytime, and, you know, even it's a New Jersey legend, the Jersey Devil, and, you know, I just went out there, you know, mm -hmm. like for a couple hours, and, you know, I got the sense of, you know, I feel like I was being watched. Really? Uh, yes. So, Nicole, Nicole, why mm -hmm. did you decide to start investigating? What were because, you doing? Because... Uh, I've always believed in the paranormal. Um, I had my first uh, encounter with the paranormal when I was about five or six years old in my own house. Mm -hmm. and really? What was that was, like? Um, it was frightening at first. And my, uh, when I told my, my family I saw this full-body apparition just drop down from outside the garage. I saw it outside the garage window, and it's very clear to me to this day. And... They thought, you know, small child, maybe her imagination or anything, but I know what I saw. Right. So do they believe yeah. you now when you tell them they, they you see something? Yeah, now that I'm an adult, my mother <laughs> finally admitted, you know, prior to us moving into the house, somebody had uh, passed away in the bathtub in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, that so was... Nicole, what did did you get any evidence from the Stanley Hotel? Um, I actually got uh, attacked by something up on the fourth floor near room 418. What happened was is that I uh, I had just seen Madame Vera and had gone upstairs on her advice to uh, you know because 
I I have a some empathic abilities. You know, I can visualize things, and you know, just draw them mm. out. Mm. And so what I did was I opened up my journal, took my pen, and I started drawing these uh, pictures. And something was telling me go up on the fourth floor. And I went up on the fourth floor because I was told there were little kids there. And I used mm. uh, some candy I had as a trigger object and then as I got to room 418 all of a sudden I just wasn't feeling myself and then all of a sudden I broke down crying and my a few friends of mine who had followed me up saw this and dragged me outside to get grounded to get air right but whatever it was I was I was just I couldn't stop crying wow Anthony wasn't that wasn't one of those rooms on the fourth floor where we actually had, it felt like it was a child, but it just felt more evil than a child? It was nothing well, I, with, the, with the flashlight? Yeah, I remember the fourth floor at the Stanley Hotel. I can't remember the room number. I, I think there were two rooms up there <clears throat> that were notorious for being haunted. And one of them was um, I- extremely evil. And I think I remember... We were in the room with uh, Mark and Debbie Constantino and um, I, I think Zach and Aaron from Ghost Adventures, and we were in there with a few other folks. And uh, I, I remember Mark and Debbie were, were um, conducting their EVP session, and they would do the quick EVP session. So basically what a quick EVP session is is they would sort of run um, an interview session. Um, they would question for about five minutes at a time, and then stop the the session, and then play the recording on their audio to see if they would capture anything. Hopefully they would, so that you can sort of continue a conversation if you heard an answer. And I remember when they reviewed it, there were multiple, um, I think there were growls, there were um, uh, a a man's voice, I think I remember, but it was saying nasty stuff, and it was just an evil room. And I'm not sure, Nicole, if that was the room that you were were at, that you got attacked, but... Yeah, I can vouch for that story. Yes, uh, that I was uh, near that room when that happened, and I'm not sure if you were on the first or the second night. Were you on Friday or Saturday? I think we were on Saturday. We so was I. Second. Yeah, okay. I was on the. Se- yeah, I can vouch for that because something came up through Mark and Debbie's. Uh, I think it was the spirit box or PX device, but it said. My fr- my friend Zori, Zori Falto, yeah. said her name, and then it said demon. And then the next minute I turn around and Zori is breaking down crying. Oh, yes, I remember, I remember that. that. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, we had, uh, me and a couple friends had to get her downstairs. We And I wouldn't leave her side until I knew she was, uh, you know, back to being herself because at that moment, you know, she yeah. she felt like dropping everything, you know, stopped in investigating and everything, but I wouldn't leave her side until the Zori I knew came back. Right. But that night, I remember that on the fourth floor, there was a lot of activity that night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that they actually that, cut they, they cut it short, I remember, because there was just too much stuff going on. Yeah, they so, did. Nicole, what's on top for you now? What, what's what's mm-hmm. your next investigation coming up? What's your next investigation next coming up? Oh, I have a I have an investigation coming up at uh, Mansfield Reformatory. This is going to be my second time going there. Mhm. And then I'm going oh, to Romania right. in May. Oh, you are going? That's yes, awesome. I am. Yes, and then uh, Zori is organizing a hunt at Waverly Hills. Mhm. And Cool. Afterwards, I'm keeping I'm keeping my entire schedule open uh, for investigations because now I'm starting to do this to get very serious into paranormal investigating. So, Nicole, That's when awesome. you first that is awesome. When when you first started, um, if, if maybe 
you know, if you want to market at Stanley or right before that locally, um, until now, what was the one thing that you learned while going out investigating? Something that you sort of either, you know, sort of had a trigger effect in you or sort of like had an awakening moment or something that was sort of profound that you learned while investigating that you didn't know before or that you didn't even know that was even possible before? Was there any one thing that, that, uh, that you can sort of share with everybody? Well, the one thing that, you know, opened my eyes is that, you know, there is a, there is a life beyond death and you know whether you're you know a true believer in it or whether you're a skeptic you know i try to keep you know the skeptical side open because you know what i could see as an orb for example could necessarily be dust or a bug right. and that was compelling because i thought you know just, you just went in there you sat for like an hour or two and then you know you you leave and then you review your evidence and you find you got squat Right. Yes, and it is very, very essential to learn your equipment because I bought a a night vision camera, and I, you know, an IR camera, and mm -hmm. before before I ever took it out into an investigation, I sat in the dark of my basement at night, using the IR light, turning it on and off in the dark, and right, good. Just went about walking. And same thing with my digital recorders. I carry more than one around. And, yes, I do carry extra batteries, you know. And depending <laughs> on where I go, depending on where I go depends the the equipment I take. For example, um, I won a, an EM Vortex at Ohio State Reformatory back in April. And mm. I took it out with me to Bobby Mackey's Music World for the very first time. But... I found myself only using it once because it wasn't a very long investigation. It was only but like four to six hours. And so mm -hmm. any any good paranormal investigator, you know, depending how long you're uh, investigating for, because, I mean, for example, the Stanley, it was only like four hours. Right. And, you know, I only find a key, for example, four-hour investigations to take my digital recorders, uh, you know, my PX device, because at Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, Missouri had a PX device, and when hers went uh, a little bit wonky, or we like to call the R2-D2 effect, it starts beeping and uh, making all these these funny noises, I always have uh, mine as a backup. Really? Nicole, can I yes. ask you, how did you like sure. Bobby Mackey's? Mackey's did you get something. Any, yeah, did you get did you get any invest, uh, any evidence there? Um, the only evidence that we really got was I heard a guitar twang, and there was nobody there, and nobody, of course, as Wanda Kay said, nobody is to touch anything on that stage, especially that guitar, because Bobby Mackey plays it. Mhm. Mm and I was just sitting with uh, two investigators, and I turn I turn my camera around, I pan it around, and I hear this ding, ding, ding. And mm -hmm. it cool. wasn't the floor was reverberating or anything. Cool. Yeah, that was, and uh, as you say, I follow my feelings, but when I was in Carl Lawson's old apartment, I went into the closet area where George is said to... Uh, attack women, mm -hmm. something got right. in me as if, you know, something was pushing, as if someone was pushing me out of there saying, you know, get out of here before I hurt you or something. And Wanda Kay had to take me outside to get air, and I had to have holy water put on me. And while everyone else was investigating, I just sat inside the gift store, you know, just, you know, thinking to myself, what the hell happened? Wow. Would you go back there? I would, I would because I'm not afraid. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to show them that I'm afraid. No. And no matter no matter who uh, who tells me, you know, whether it be another paranormal investigator or uh, or someone who saw it on TV and say, oh, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to be like, I'm going back there. Don't care. Don't care what you cool. say. I'm going back. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, and thank you, Nicole. That. You're I'm welcome, sorry, you want to guys. Say Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, th Thanks thank you for just sh sh yeah, sharing all the stories that, 
you know, I mean, you, you, you told the story basically of how you first started and what could possibly happen on investigations and um, letting folks know that it's not just, you know, rosies and you know, roses and a bed of roses basically out there. You know, it is tough and it's something that you actually have to be committed to doing. And, um, and uh, things like that could happen to you and you just have to learn to deal with it and, and move on and continue if that's what you actually want to do with your life. Yes, that Nicole. Is exactly. Nicole, can you do us a favor? Yes. When you get back sure. from Romania, give us a call uh, and give us a report as to what happens. I sure will. Okay. All right, I promise. Thank you. Very, very great. Much for calling. Thank you for thanks for calling, Nicole. We'll talk to you soon. All right, talk to you later. All right, bye bye. All right, bye bye. Cool. Lucy. That was that was actually yeah. great. I remember I remember uh, Nicole. She was great, yeah. and I, I do remember I do remember that night at Stanley. Yeah, there was a lot going on in that fourth floor. There was an yeah, awful lot. I, I remember, but we actually um, we had the privilege of um, winning some auctions for the how many <laughs> rooms was it? Four, four? <laughs> three, three, four. <laughs> three or four rooms and. Go ahead, you tell the story. Oh, God. Um, well, I am forever in debt to this man um, because of him and winning an auction for actually room 217, the Stephen King room. Um, we actually, Anthony actually won the auction for that, and we actually got to spend the night in that room. Um, another member of the party, I believe we won, the, she won the uh, auction for um Oh God, I don't even know the the number of it, but Lord, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I Dunraven. forgot his oh. name already. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Dunraven's room on the Dunraven, fourth floor. Dunraven, that's it. Well, we, we won his room, and actually, there's another room that's haunted in the uh, other building. That was, um, it's actually the room where Ghost Hunters was, and in the episode, the table moved. So we actually had three rooms, and I'm trying to think. I think the second night. I'm not sure. And then we, we had the. I know we, we had we, we had the fourth floor. Uh huh. We had uh-huh. but, we had the fourth floor. We had the second floor. We had room thirteen twenty um, in the it, other building at the Stanley. It was an awesome trip because I can honestly say that in what like three three nights four nights there, I actually spent the night in three haunted rooms for three nights. I mean, it was awesome. Um, I actually ended up. Lasting now, this is where you have to be patient comes in. I outlasted everybody in the party, and everybody else was falling asleep and going back to their rooms and stuff. I actually sat in room two seventeen um, probably for three to four hours straight with the spirit box by myself, and it turned out to be probably one of the most awesome experiences I ever had. I had a conversation with a male spirit in that room named Philip and it was it was it was a real conversation. It was an intelligent conversation. The words that were coming through, um the things that were happening, but it's also a lesson that I learned because I didn't have a recorder with me. So I don't have any evidence. Okay, so and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I think also, too, we had gotten some awesome EVPs over in 1320 um, in Lord Dunraven's room. I don't remember how much uh, evidence we got in there. I know, um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I got much in the other rooms. Anthony, did you? Or I, I just remember, I think it was even the, the, the same room that Nicole was just talking about. Um, we had heard um, voices coming from that closet, remember? It was that mm-hmm. do- that closet door that was next to the bed. It was a very small room, um, but I remember we had gotten um, some sort of voices or some sort of noises coming from that closet, and I think it's actually known. Oh, remember it was the door. The door was closed, and remember the door handle started moving? Oh, that's right. That was in Lord Dunraven's room, right. Right, I remember that. The door was actually closed. We're all standing. No one is near the door. The door handle starts moving. We open up the door, no one in the hallway. I mean, if someone had walked down the hallway, you would have heard them or you would have seen them. Nowhere within anywhere close enough 
to make that door handle move. That I remember that one because that door handle was actually that was moving. That was right. Awesome. Well, Lucy, I, I actually have some audio clips now. Can I play some? Sure. What kind of audio clips do you have? Well, I have some clips from a couple of the experts in the paranormal field that discuss what the dangers are to first-time investigators and what to look for. I mean, if you're going to get advice, get it from the best in the business, or at least from people who have been it for over 20 years. The first clip that I have um, is from a gentleman named John Zaffis, and Lucy and I have had the luxury of investigating with Mr. Zaffis. Um, and if you're not familiar with John Zappas, he's a demonologist, and he has studied and been in the paranormal field for over 36 years. Um, and he actually has his own show out now called Haunted Collector, I think, Lucy, right? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> well, let me play this clip. It, w it was taken from a website called DangersOfTheParanormal.com. It's a great website. You should go and check it out. Anyway, here is a clip from an interview they did with John and discuss what he thought the dangers of the paranormal are and what you should do. And he actually also gives advice on children and the paranormal. So take a listen. Investigators, you got to remember uh, today a lot of people just jump right into it. You know, here again, sometimes it's not always their fault. There's no one around to work with. You, you know, you, you try to find people to team up with. A lot of times organizations don't let people in. And people venture out on their own and, you know, they're trying to learn and try and understand and get themselves in some serious trouble and get spirit attached to them, um, do different things. So I always tell people to be very cautious, practice whatever your belief system is. I don't care if you worship a five-pound crystal. As long as you call in on the positive to be able to help protect yourself. And with children, you got to remember, you got when kids are growing and, um, you know, they're young, they're very vulnerable, they're very impressionable. So I think we gotta be a little guarded and a little careful with the younger kids. Within my organization and my belief system, not my religious belief system, but I feel you know around 17, 18 is a, is a good age to actually start venturing into it. They're a little bit more level-headed at that point in time. I don't know, I've raised teenagers and I know the, you'll jump right in to do anything you possibly can. I know I did I was, as a kid. There are dangers in anything you do once you enter the paranormal arena. arena. And you know, here again, EVP, psychic photography, going to these locations, provoking, uh, seances, everything falls under the same category. I know people that have done all these things and they've never had any issues. We deal with people that do. And here again, you know, certain people are more susceptible than other people. Sensitive people have to be extremely guarded when getting involved with these things. You know, I, I deal with a lot of psychics, mediums. I've always worked with them. I always will. And some of these people fall so, to some serious, serious uh, attacks upon their lives. So, you know, you've got to be very careful. They're going to hone right in on those types of things. So I always tell people to be very careful. Getting involved with these things, use common sense. It's a key thing with this work. If you get a bad feeling about something, don't do it. You will find today, you know, with paranormal investigators, I know I do, that once they experience something and they start to have things and they realize, oh, whoa, this ain't a big joke. There is something to this whole paranormal realm things. It makes them st take a step back and think about things. And you you'll hear that time and time again. People will say that to me. Now I have to think about this because I really didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in any of this negative stuff, now I have to look at it from a different perspective. That was great. I think uh, John pretty much um, put it simple. Just be aware, um, you know, g go into this to this field and to this what he called line of work um, with precaution and make sure that you do your research and know what you're getting into before you actually start and begin it. Do you have any Anthony. comments on that, Lucy? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? John Zaffis is probably one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. He is awesome. But you know what? I really wish I would have heard that clip before I went to the seance. Um, one thing I don't think people really think about, because I know I didn't, a seance is actually investigating, but it's probably in a more intense situation. 
So when I went, this was the first time I'd ever gone to a seance. And like he said, I mean, if you're sensitive, if you pick up on hunches or feelings, um, you really need to be careful. And I went into the situation not really thinking anything of it, and it actually did affect me. So a lot of the things he's talking about, I mean, they're, they're real. I mean, it, it, it is a real thing. So you can't be too careful. I think that's what the bottom line is. Don't you think, Anthony? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and I've said this to you before, Lucy, that, you know, if you are a sensitive, if, if you're just a sensitive person in nature, but if you're more of a sensitive within the paranormal world, you are actually like a sponge. And you will soak up anything and everything that's out there, including good entities and bad entities. And so um, you really have to guard yourself. And you really have to make sure that you are grounded and that you are not, um, what I like to say, you don't sort of zone out when you're in that 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 uh, predicament when you're within a seance or doing a Ouija board, you really don't want to zone out because that's just like leaving your door open. You really have to stay grounded and basically, you know, you're, you're fighting the entire time. You're fighting out whatever's trying to actually come in to, to you know, through your mind, to your door, uh, through the window of, of your mind. Um, and so, like you were saying, just you got to be guarded. Um, can yeah, I go into the next why. audio clip? Can I say something? That's why I'm so glad that when we investigate, you keep checking on me. You always make sure, because if I start getting dizzy or if I start feeling something, you always do check on me, which goes back to the, uh, the previous list where you always need to keep an eye out for your other team members. And it's just, I'm just so glad that you're there. <laughs> There's a lot of times, you know, because you like to talk, and so when we're out and we're, we're doing an, a, an investigation or a location, you know, and I don't hear anything coming from you, I, I know there's something wrong. All right. Yeah. Here, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. The next audio clip is of Mark and Debbie Constantino, and you probably know about them. They are regulars on Ghost Adventures. They are the best in the field of capturing EVPs. I think they are just amazing, and they, they really know what they are doing. And, and they're a lot of fun to be around, too. Um, here's a clip um, of advice that they gave on beginners who are starting out in the field. And, again, what dangers to, to look out for. Okay, hi, I'm Mark Constantino. I'm Debbie Constantino. When you're dealing with the paranormal in general, there are people out there that really know what they're doing. Um, a lot of these events have um, credible demonologists you can learn information from. I wouldn't go online to get your certificate. I would go to the best. If I want to lose weight, I go to somebody that's lost a great deal of weight. If I want to work out, I go to the best teacher who has results. The dangers, I'm not really worried. I've lived in a haunted house. I've, you know, dealt with psychic phenomena my whole life, paranormal stuff. But, um, you know, I equate it to, I saw Jaws. I don't deal with great white sharks well. The chances of me going in the ocean, swimming in Cape Cod, getting bit by a great white shark, not one in a million perhaps. Now, is it possible? You'd have to say yes, it's possible. So, you know, just prepare yourselves as best you can. You know, that's all you can do in anything you do, whether it's the paranormal or anything else. But just be aware of the dangers. And that's all Mark and I are saying. Um, I would say as far as protecting protecting yourself, you know, it's a good idea you know, to get in touch with your higher power, whatever that may be, and, and say a prayer of protection if you're going to start doing EVP, which is what Debbie and I specialize in, electronic voice phenomena, which is spirit voices captured on recording devices. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, even if you're not doing EVP, if you're just going to go into a cemetery, you know, it, it, even if it's during the day, you know, and you're going in when you're allowed to go in, or if you're going to go into a haunted location, uh, I would say just... You know, try to protect yourself as best you can because Debbie and I do this all the time and, and we've had some nasty things follow us home, you know, and maybe it was just because we didn't protect ourselves enough. So, you know, we're not immune to it and I think we're into it to where we know maybe a little bit better the dangers of it than somebody just getting into it. So that would be the, uh, the advice that I would, I would just give somebody just starting out. I, I really do like the Constantinos, and I, I highly suggest that you visit their website, Spirits, 
speak.com and listen to some of their recordings and EVPs. And I actually believe some of their EVPs, Lucy, you and I were firsthand witnesses to. Mm-hmm. They are probably the coolest couple I know. They are so awesome. And their work is amazing. The things that they record and capture are just phenomenal. I mean, they're 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 a great if you get a chance to go to one of their lectures at one of the events, please do. I mean, they're awesome. They're absolutely awesome. In in the beginning of the clip, um Debbie had actually mentioned something about um you don't need to go online and get a certificate. There are actually websites out there that um claim to um certify you in paranormal investigating. And uh, to me, it's just like going online and being a certified minister to to conduct a wedding. It, it really is nonsense. You you can't get a certificate. You can't get a degree in paranormal paranormal investigating. You can actually learn about the field and maybe get college course credits in it and stuff like that. But there really is no degree. You can't be certified. Uh, to be certified, you actually should be in the field for quite a while um, and be experienced. That's something that, you know, it's sort of the opposite of what you do when you're trying to get a job. You know, you, you get your degree first and then you go out and get your work experience. Here you in in the paranormal world, you really have to get your field experience first, and then maybe you can sort of get that accredited as being an expert later on in life. Don't you agree, Lucy? You mean that twenty nine ninety five certificate I have, is it worth anything? <laughs> uh, n- no. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It, it, you cannot buy the experience. You cannot buy um, learning how to do this. It comes from actually doing it, learning it, and your experience. The more you learn, I like to say that every investigation I go on, and I know, Anthony, you feel the same way, every investigation that we go on, we're still learning. There's there's no way that you'll ever know everything that, that is there is to know because everything is, there's so much out there to explore. We're all searching for the same thing. So as long as you are willing to learn and keep learning, you're going to become a good investigator. Um you know, like like we said before, there are no experts. There are no experts, but there are people that may be a little bit more experienced. And as long as you keep going, as long as you keep learning, as long as you keep that open mind, you are going to become a very good investigator. You're going to enjoy it, and you're going to learn. Anthony, oh, um, wait, wait, we have actually uh, another phone caller, um, I believe, from awesome. East Virginia. From East Virginia. Hello, you are on the air with Paranormal Review Radio. Hey, good afternoon. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm doing great. My name is uh, KV. Um, I'm with uh, WLNE News Talk Radio in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I'm just sitting back and enjoying the show, listening to a little bit. And uh, I think you got a fantastic show, and, and your guest is awesome. Oh, great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank no you. Problem. And, uh, yeah, like I said, y'all definitely got a good show going on. And uh, like I said, uh, I do a paranormal talk show on WWE Radio in Richmond, matter of fact. And uh, I was sit back, and uh, my partner and I, we listen to different shows on the Internet. And you, you guys definitely got a good show, and you got a great guest. Thank That's you great, so great. much, well, Carolyn. That's so great to hear. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks for listening in. Yeah, like I said, I'm not going to bother y'all nothing like that, but I'm you know, going to sit back a little bit. And uh, listen to the show, and uh, I don't. It's not, it's not my show, so I'm not going to play with this anymore. But I just want to sit back and join your guests and just listen a little bit and see what's going on. Great, Th- thank you thank so much you. for calling in. We'll talk thank to you, you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh wow, that was actually, that was cool. Thank you. It's that was so great. Cool. Okay, so um, gee. I'm so excited now. Um, Anthony, can we share some of the tips that we've picked up from investigating with the people that we've investigated with? Yeah, sure. Um, I've had the privilege of investigating with many of the experts in the paranormal field. I've been around Chip Coffey, Chris Fleming, um, Adam Blay, like I've said before, Mark and Debbie Constantino. I've been with Jason and Grant from Ghost Hunters. 
Zach, Nick, and Aaron from Ghost Adventures, Troy Taylor, a few other psychic and clairvoyant medium, mediums and in, in, infamous in their field. Um, and I've learned a lot from these people, not just about paranormal and investigating, uh, you know, but about things like religion and life. The paranormal world is not just about ghosts and demons. It's much more than that. It's amazing what you will even learn about yourself while investigating. You could almost equate it to a therapy session. Uh, but getting back to the tips that I've learned, well, I, I mentioned in a previous episode that I learned the word assimilation game, if I sort of had to title it, from Mark and Debbie Constantino. Basically, when you are trying to communicate with a young or child spirit, use you know you use this word game technique, um, and um, you, you try and get the, the spirits or the entity to actually answer and give you what you want to prove that there's intelligent spirit with you. So the word game goes like this: if I say cat. You say dog, cat, and then hopefully you wait for the answer of dog. Uh, I really like this technique, and I've actually used it on investigations. Um, I also learned from Aaron Goodwin on Ghost Adventures that you should be creative with your talk when doing an EVP session. He said one time that you should say what you're feeling and don't hold it in. You know, if, if the place feels creepy, say it out loud, or if the place is cold or hot, just say it. Say anything. You know, nine times out of ten, the spirits will react to your comments, not just your questions. I also remember one time when I was at the Otisaga Hotel investigating it with the guys from Ghost Hunters, and Chip Co Coffee was there. I was standing outside smoking a cigarette with Jason. Yes, Jason from Ghost Hunters smokes. And uh, Chip Coffee was there. <laughs> he doesn't smoke. Um, and Chip was Chip Coffee. I remember he was playing with his new iPhone um, app, and uh, the app was basically all different fart noises. And he had us <laughs> laughing so hard. Someone next to me, I remember at the time, said to him, "Wow, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't think you were like this. You know, so fun and, and stuff. Do you, I, mean, I think they were saying something like, you know, do you do this all the time or when you're on breaks during an investigation?" And Chip answered, "Yes, you have to be able to break away for a few minutes and laugh." or break away from the stressfulness that you're investigating uh, or how it can get so stressful so that you are refreshed when you go back in and continue on the investigation. But you shouldn't go too overboard, just enough to get like a laugh or two and then just head back. Well, I make sure now that I take a break on an investigation and think about something else or sort of laugh for a minute and then, and then get back into the investigative mode. It really does actually help your mind to focus. Now, Lucy, did you learn anything or have you learned anything? What's the biggest thing that you've sort of learned? Well, I have to say that at Mansfield, um, I did learn from Nick Ross what a real EVP was. We actually had gone into the toilet room, and there was a bunch of us, and I actually had the opportunity. I had my recorder, and Nick had his recorder there, and we were asking questions, and we played it back right away, and there was a response on Nick's recorder, but it wasn't on mine. And I actually learned that that's a true EVP. I mean, that we both had the recorders there, same time, same you're right next to each other, but yet when we played it back after the questions, you can clearly hear there's a response on Nick's recorder, but it didn't show up on mine. Um, mm. Let's see. Uh, I also learned how to use trigger objects from Ghost Adventures. Um, at one point, I actually became a trigger object back on Fifth Dimension Paranormal. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the best thing of all from Chris Fleming, I learned how to use a spirit box. Um, as we're going to get into a little bit later, probably the most amazing thing that I've ever learned so far. I, I, I can't say enough about it. Okay, let's move on to paranormal groups and when to know if it's right for you. I personally think paranormal groups are great, whether it's two people or 20 people. You know, whenever you can find people who share your passion and commitment for the paranormal world, then a group is the best thing you can join. It actually helps to validate your interests and, you know, it also gives you an outlet to share and experience things with. With that said, you need to make sure you know who the members are before joining. You don't want to either start a group with people you don't know or join a group with people you just met. Learn about their previous investigations. Learn about how they investigate, 
where they travel, and what places they investigate. Try and meet with the members individually as well as collectively to sort of get a sense of how they operate when they're alone and then also when they're in a the group. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of knowing these things before joining a group or starting one on your own, but life is all about learning from your mistakes. Don't, just don't be afraid to, to leave a group or end a group if you feel it's not working out or that it may be too much trouble. Um, and the worst thing you want to, to go on an investigation and not be happy just because you're not happy with the members of the group. You shouldn't have to feel that way. Paranormal investigating is supposed to be something you enjoy, something you do as a hobby on the side with friends, not something you have to worry about or feel uncomfortable with while being with them. Lucy and I started a group earlier this year and thought it was uh, a great team and a great decision. You know, the group was called Fifth Dimension Paranormal Investigators. We, you know, quickly learned that it was a, uh, a bit difficult to work with different types of personalities that all had different agendas as to what to investigate and how to investigate and what extra activities we should be doing. When, you know, when no one agreed on anything, it was just too difficult to move forward, so we just basically decided to end the group. But that doesn't mean we end there. I mean, I've started a new group, you know, recently, Dimension Paranormal Investigators, and like I said, hopefully it'll, you know, become public in this January and with new members. You know, I, I actually have already started looking at investigations and lined up some stuff for hopefully in the spring and summer, so, you know, I, I, I hopefully think it's going to be great. Well, I think it is, and actually, I do have some thoughts on this one. Um, I do guess the most important thing that you mentioned is finding like-minded people. It was a very sad thing to see our first group end, but if people don't have the same goals and it isn't fun anymore, investigating is serious, but you have to be able to enjoy it. If you feel like you have to walk on eggshells not to offend anyone, then why bother? Um, you also have to look at what's their reason for investigating. Now, are they looking for the same thing as you are? It's never going to work if everyone has a different agenda. Investigating should be about the paranormal, and we're all looking for the same thing. Um, it's not about, you know, being popular. It's not about being like that hot guy on TV. Um, evidence. Evidence of the other side. You know, if someone is looking for something other than that, the group just might not work. Now, do these people truly like each other? You know, you really have to like the people you investigate with. You're going to be spending a lot of time with them. You're going to be traveling with them. You're going to be learning from them. You know, their strengths may be an area that you're weak in. Are you comfortable enough with them to ask them questions? Trust me, I ask questions all the time. Don't I, Anthony? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you have to look for people who are willing to commit to the team. Not just when they can or when they feel like it, but really commit to the team schedule and to the projects that are coming up with the team. Are these people who want to get involved? Now, if the rest of the team is working on research, making contacts, trying to find out about a location, does everyone participate? Or do they only show up when it's time to investigate? Basic and the last thing, which is probably the most important thing, is their trust. Your team members should have your back. Everyone should be looking out for each other. You never know what kind of situation you're going to find yourself in during an investigation. The team should be willing to help any member who needs it. If you don't have that trust, if you don't like somebody, it's not going to happen. And in case anything does happen, how can you depend on someone to have your back? You have to be able, everybody on the team has to be willing to look out for each other. I think that's the most important thing of all. Um, don't you, Anthony? Yeah, I, I do. I do agree. Trust is, is the main thing, and trust is what keeps the group together. Without it, you um, you know, it just leaves too much doubt and too much question in your mind, and it sort of interferes with with the team, the commitment, the mission, and the investigation uh, of of what you're doing actually. Um, so I believe that yeah, trust is definitely okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get technical. I want to quickly review some of the paranormal equipment 
we have used, as well as some of the equipment that is available to all investigators. I have to start off by saying that paranormal investigating has to be one of the most expensive hobbies out there. I mean, you really have to love this field to be able to commit to some of the price tags on some gadgets out there. Lucy, I would have to say right now I have spent maybe close to almost $2,000 on equipment and accessories. Now, I'm not saying you have to spend a lot of money to investigate. You can basically show up at a place with a flashlight and your enthusiasm, and that's it. But if you want to advance and experience more of an investigation, it may cost you some money initially. Here's a list of equipment that's actually typically used on investigations. A digital video recorder. I mean, you should, I mean, if, if this is something that you want to get into, a, um, a digital video recorder with night vision is something that you should invest in. And you really should buy quality because your digital re video recorder is actually <clears throat> going to be one of your primary tools. Other than an audio, um, a, a digital recorder, your, your video recorder is actually uh, basically one of your primary tools while investigating. Um, digital still cameras, you know, it's all about the megapixels. Um, also, digital imaging and editing programs. You, you know, you, you take pictures in, in the dark a lot of times, and you really want some sort of imaging program or editing program that you're able to sort of clean up the fuzziness and maybe sharpen up the images so that you're able to correct some of the things and, and just see things better. You don't want to enhance. You don't want to manipulate the pictures so that, you know, it turns into something else or it turns into something that you want to see. You really should use just an editing program to just cleanly clean up a picture so that you can see what is actually there. If you have to continually edit something and change it and manipulate it and make it to something that it is, then that's not evidence. Um, that's just a creative photo that you just created yourself. Um, 35 millimeter film camera. Yes, I'm actually talking about film. Um, they should also still be used. Um, they, 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 the film camera processes the images through a chemical process, not through an electronic sense array. And it actually, um, some pictures actually come out better on film than a digital camera. So, you know, maybe try using your old one. You know, dust it off, take it out of the closet, and maybe try it out one night. Um, I said night vision camera. Um, digital and analog tape recorder. I um, I love these. I love the digital <laughs> recorders. I know Lucy, you love it too. Um, yes. And I do. <laughs> and actually, you know, you can have more than one. And Lucy, you were talking about this before with what you picked up when you were with Nick out on an investigation from Ghost mm -hmm. Adventures. That you know, what you get on one recorder, you may not get on another, and that's pretty much evidence that it that it is a spirit entity because if you know if if a ball drops in a room and you've got two recorders, you're going to hear that sound on both recorders. There's no question about that. But for the reason as to one spirit voice coming up on one and not on another, and they're only two inches apart, that's questionable. That's something that you can sort of put forth as evidence uh, of any kind, basically. Um, as I've said before, flashlights are important. you got to bring them. I don't care if they're gigantic or if they're little minis on a, um, a wristlet, you got to bring them. Uh, EMF detectors, electromagnetic frequency detectors. These are pretty good. Um, I have them. I actually have a couple of them. And um, they're actually good for picking up sort of that, you know, the electronic magnetic field in, in, the, in the room, in the location. It uh, will help determine whether or not a, uh, an entity or a spirit is within the vicinity. But you've got to be careful, though. Like I was saying before, these EMF detectors will also pick up, uh, because it does pick up electronic magnetic, magnetic fields, it's going to pick up um, anything electrical within the location, within the room, within the walls, the floor, or the ceiling. So you really should do a test, a ground test, a base test is what they call it in the field. And roam around with the EMF detector around the room, around the location first to get a base reading. And just see if there's any sort of continuous detections in a certain area. And if there are, it's most likely that there's something either in the wall or there is something electrical, um, man-made electrical that's actually creating that and it's not spirit. So you should actually try and do that first. Um, infrared thermal scanners. Um, these are 
basically to capture temperature in the room. It's been said that um, a spirit and entity will also change the temperature of the space, either will get colder or will get hotter. Um, and then there's always that theory that, you know, a room will get colder if there is a evil or demonic spirit, but they have also have said that for when it gets hotter as well. So um, you really can't tell, but an infrared thermal scanner will actually help determine um, the temperature of the room. And again, you, you run around the room in the location and you do a base reading first. You grab this piece of equipment and you go around the room um, and you, you actually bring it up over your head and down below so that you're not just getting the reading at your chest level or head level. You want to get below and above and see if there are any changes in the, in the, um, in the temperature. And basically, you try and get that middle ground. So if you raise your hand with this detector and you get 80 degrees and you go below towards the ground and you get 75 degrees and that sort of continuous throughout the room, your base reading is somewhere in between 75 and 80 degrees. Then when you continue to do your investigation and you find that you've got a spike, either it go lower and it goes to 60 degrees very quickly, or it goes even higher to 90 degrees for no apparent reason, then that's a suggestion that there could be some possible um, interference from an entity or an existence of some sort of spirit within the location. Walkie-talkies so, are actually pretty good. Uh, I'm sorry, Lucy, you wanted to say something? So my hot flashes are an evidence of something demonic? <laughs> the change do, you, do you have an internal <laughs> infrared thermal scanner in your body? Yes, I do. <laughs> All right, so then I'm going to take you around the room then, up and down, and we're going to use you. I can I can return my thermal scanner then. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll save me a lot of money. Um, Walkie-talkies are good. So, for instance, when Lucy sort of tends to go off on her own, um, <laughs> Like she is, but you're doing pretty good. You're getting better. Um, Walkie-talkies walkie -talkies are good to um, keep, again, keep that communication open with your other um, team members or investigators um, yes, out of location. Yes, I will. <laughs> What's that? Yes, I will. I promise. <laughs> It, it, it's a good thing to have because if you are at a large location, um, you want to keep in contact. And plus also, too, you know, if you've got heavy spirit activity that's happening where you're at, um, you want to call your other team members to come with you to sort of experience that or help validate what, what uh, you're seeing or hearing. So it's always good to have a walkie-talkie. Cell phones, again, it's a good idea to have cell phones in hand. Um, but again, you want to have it off. Only use that in an emergency, but walkie-talkie is good. Also, too, I've learned, and I've learned this from Jason Grant, uh, um, Jason and Grant from Ghost Hunters, that um, walkie-talkies sometimes give off false readings on EMF detectors. So make sure that um, you do that test beforehand. Either you do it at the location or at home or in the hotel room before you're going out to that investigation and test it. Put the walkie-talkie near your EMF or any of your other devices just to see if there's any sort of displacement of um, this magnetic field or, or electric fields coming from these other equipments and how they affect each other. Uh, if there is an effect that happens, then you can literally know basically that you know, your, your walkie-talkie cannot be close to your EMF detector, so you have to keep them apart if that's the case. It all depends on the equipment because, again, labels and brands are all made differently um, with one product as with another. So, um, Motion detectors, these can really give you a heads up. Um, they're really not detect, uh, expensive, but motion detectors are good because if you're not in the room at a location, again, if you're at a large location, um, the motion detectors are good with sound. You really want sound because if the motion detector is going off, you want to be able to hear it so that you're able to go um, to that location. Uh, extra batteries. Lucy knows all about this one. You really need to have extra batteries with you at all times. <laughs> I'm making you crack up tonight, huh? Yes, you are. You really are. <laughs> Uh, extra batteries, have everything. Check your equipment before you leave to go to your location. You have to make sure that you have every single different type of battery that you will need because many of the pieces of equipment that you have will require different types of batteries. So make sure that you have at least 
two or three. It all depends on the length of time that you're going to be at a location. But um, make sure that you have at least two or three sets of each of the different types of batteries with you, just in case you have to make that change. Um, either it naturally drains on its own, or as Lucy has experienced many times, that uh, spirits and entities will actually drain your batteries. They they use that energy for themselves, either to manifest or to to speak to you. So they will take that energy away from that battery. If they can't take it from you, they'll take it from your equipment. And a lot of times they'll just drain that battery out completely, so you'll have to replace it a lot of times. Um, watches. Have a watch. Have something with time on it. You really want to stick to a schedule and keep a schedule going. So make sure that you have a watch with you or something that can tell time. And, uh, you know, a good old-fashioned pen and paper. Have that handy at all times. You really should record what goes on physically down on the log of what's going on. Not just rely on what you've recorded either on video or audio, but keep your paper and pen because most of the times your feelings are not coming out on audio or on video. And so you really want to write down sort of what you're feeling at that moment, either anxiety, anger, happiness, sadness, whatever it is. You know, you should write it write it down on a piece of paper. That way, when you review evidence, you can sort of link the two together and see if there's any connection or hit. And this is another thing. That, this is the last thing that I'll talk about on this, but it's the most important thing that I actually think should be with every investigator. Not a lot of investigators think about it. Is a first aid kit because you never know what's going to happen. You have you will get hurt. I guarantee you, you will get hurt. Um, you know, you 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 you're in these places that you can't see that are old and abandoned, you know, you've got nails sticking out of places, you've got broken wood all over the place, you will get nicked, you will get sort of scratched or whatever it is from the location itself. So a first aid kit is always good to have on handy. You know, and, and I have to say, basically all of the above pieces of equipment, with the addition of maybe like a laser grid or uh, an RTEVP recorder with a spirit box, PX device, night vision still camera, night vision video camera, and the RR lights, which I have, I, I think they're all great. But again, you pick your weapon. Choose and pick your weapon. Again, like I said before, you can go to a haunted location with just a flashlight and your eagerness to learn, and that's all that you need, and you can just rely on your intuition. Lucy, what's your favorite piece of equipment? You know, Anthony, listening to your list, um, there's one thing that I think I need. Honestly, I my favorite piece of equipment is probably my holy water. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, <laughs> when I do investigate, I travel relatively light, okay? Um, I haven't always been able to buy a whole lot of equipment. But, you know, that's okay with me. I've learned to use my senses more than ever when investigating. You don't have to own a whole lot to be an investigator. If you can, that's great. But never, ever feel like you are any less an investigator than the person who has everything. Learn about the different types of invest, uh, equipment and invest in one piece to start. Now, as you go along, you can add more. You might find one item that is your go-to piece of equipment. Now, my, my favorite happens to be the spirit box. You you may have seen the guys on Ghost Adventures using the spirit box in several of their episodes. I absolutely love this piece of equipment. Okay, Now, a spirit box is a device that is used to allow spirits to communicate or speak by using radio frequencies. Um, it's also called a ghost box or Frank's box. It has been said that Thomas Edison actually was working on a ghost communication device. Sort of kind of like a early version of Spirit Box. Now, no one knows if, if this is true, but it is a wonderful thought. The modern Spirit Box is an AM or FM tuner, and it sweeps back and forth through radio stations, making a sort of white noise. Now, out of that noise, spirits can actually make contact by using the signals that are being picked up by the sweep of the station. Now, the speed of the sweep... Um, is controlled. You can control it e to go either slower or faster. Spirits can communicate with the living through the box, almost like using a walkie-talkie. Now, the noise does take a little getting used to, and not everyone can get used to it right away. It does take a bit of practice to train yourself to hear the messages. They can be either one word 
or you might be lucky enough to get a full sentence. Some investigators record the sound and go back and listen to it later. I've gotten so comfortable using the spirit box, I usually can hear the words and the noise right away. I have used the spirit box, like I said before, in room 217 at the Stanley Hotel, and I did talk to that spirit, and his name was Philip. He was English, he liked music, and he actually called me love. Now, that experience was probably one of the first and best that I've ever had using the spirit box. But unfortunately, like I said before, I learned another valuable lesson. Always take an audio recorder. I don't have any evidence. All I have are my memories. So you never know when you're going to get something amazing. And when you do, you're going to want to share it with the world when you get it. Anthony, I need to repeat what you said before, okay? Um, We don't claim to be experts in any way, shape, or form, okay? I'm sure that you can see by some of the things that we shared with you tonight, especially about me, um, what we've talked about are the things that we've learned about in our ongoing paranormal journey. I wish I knew a lot of it when I first started, but you know what? I'm learning on every investigation that I go on. I hope that what we've shared with you will help you on your own paranormal journey. You know, just a little something to add to everything else you'll learn on your own. The learning never stops, and you should enjoy every moment of it. If you're not enjoying the journey, then maybe it's not for you. I did, you know, when we were doing research for the subject, I read a line on the web, and it pretty much summed this whole whole, uh, subject up for me. And it goes like this. It is not the destination that's the prize, but it is the journey that brings the reward. I think it's perfect. In the paranormal, we really don't know what we're going to find at the destination, but we do know about the journey, and we should embrace that part of it because once you do, the destination will become the prize. What do you think, Anthony? Well, what you see on TV and what you hear on radio, even on this show, is not what real paranormal investigation is all about. The shows like Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures only show you a condensed version of what the investigation is about. They've taken hours and hours, sometimes days of investigations, and put it all together with a nice bow in you know in a one-hour episode. But the reality of investigation is hours and hours of not hearing or experiencing a sound. Sometimes you go to a location and get nothing. But that should not disappoint you. That should not make you say, oh, forget it, I'm not wasting my time. If this is your response, then paranormal investigating is not for you. If you still want to continue, then I say go for it. Do whatever you need to do to make the time and start investigating. Even if it's a local cemetery or even a parking lot, just get out there and do the best you can because practice will make perfect and you will soon soon see that what you're doing may change your life and even change other people's perception of the afterlife. It's a commitment and it means dedication, but it's also rewarding and fun at the same time. One other piece of advice I have to give is never investigate your own home. I caution everyone. Your home is your sacred place. It's the place you go to to get away from things. You don't want to start investigating your home if it's not known to be haunted because investigating will actually bring upon spirits and other things you don't want there. Start outside the home and take precaution. Learn about the field, learn about the equipment, and you'll soon learn about yourself and the afterlife. Well, That's it for tonight's show. We hope you enjoyed it and learned a thing or two about paranormal investigating. I want to thank Lucy and thank you all for tuning in. I think we had a lot of fun putting this together and speaking to you all tonight. If if you want to know more or have any questions, feel free to write to us. Like I said before, we have a a new email for the show. It's called paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. Or check us out on our Facebook page, Paranormal Review Radio. Lucy, what is on the agenda for next Friday? Okay. Next week's show is going to be really special. Okay. Are you ready for this? We are going to be talking to a lady that we've had the pleasure of investigating with a couple times at probably one of the most infamous haunted places in the world. 
Ms. Wanda Kay, have you ever wondered what it actually really like is like at Mackey's? Well, next week, Wanda is going to be talking to us live from Bobby Mackey's Music World. It is going to be a show that you really won't want to miss. So make sure you join us next Friday night. As always, thank you, Anthony, for everything you do to put this show on. And I want to thank every single one of our amazing listeners and to everybody who called us tonight. You guys rock. Okay? So good night. Good night, everybody. Paranormal.